I mean, I mean it, John. The, um, I can't tell you all the, uh, all the different conversations we've had over the years in different settings, and never once you know, talked about that. Why, like, why is that? Why, just, it, it, you're just one of these naturally inquisitive guys that loves to go to the adjacent spaces. Um, did, have you always been that way? Yeah, probably. Uh, I'm a nonlinear thinker. That's good and that's bad. That's not good for, for academia, by the way. <laughs> but it's great for invention. Yeah. And, and just being curious about everything, that, that's always amazed me. And I'm also really curious about people. I'm, when uh, Worman started TED, I was absolutely fascinated. Uh, I was also a charter investor in, uh, in uh, Fast Company. Right. And, and loved the fact that they kind of redefined how you talk and ask about not just you know, a better business idea, but what does it mean in the big picture? How is it going to affect the world, pro and con? And you know, talks like Marx, it just are the wake-up well, call, and we occasionally hear those things and uh, say, you know, wow, that's, that's a different type of problem. And that one requires not just design thinking, but design thinking squared. Right. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. So uh, let me make sure that I cover what I wanted to talk to you about because there's several other things that uh, we absolutely have to talk about as well. So uh, I'm, I'm taken by some of the slides we've seen about this is what technology was, you know, and this is how fast it changes. So take me back to the time when uh, in Alex's slide there where he had the tools, you know, the, the tool he would put up there is a chest splitter, a rib splitter, where we used to crack people open in order to get to their coronary arteries uh, and do cabbage procedures, you know, to, to, to take grafts and put them there. And the procedure uh, was major, major surgery uh, requiring days and weeks of recovery uh, and can you take me to back to what that was like and why you saw it differently? Like, what was going on then? Um, I, I didn't see it first. Yep. I just watch others. Hmm. And uh, turns out, uh, I've been in a sort of a dubious distinction in the medical business since 1960. And I actually met Earl Bakken, who was the founder of Medtronic uh, at that time. And not only was medical technology much crude, it was, it was really mom and pop little companies that would come and make the products that a doctor would think of. It wasn't high volume, it was you know, iron lungs and things like that. J.H. Uh, Emerson uh, from Boston. And uh, I actually uh, met uh, Michael DeBakey in the late 70s when, uh, and he was an extraordinary innovator as, as we know yep. now. Uh, but he showed me his laboratories that he had equipped with television. Now, this is in the 1960s. I don't, <laughs> this, this is long before JVC and Sony and yeah. so forth had, had useful television. So well, there were always these sinkers around who were pushing the barriers. But in those early days, medicine that was dramatic to really fix people was always performed by gods. And... Uh, Dwight Harkin, who was uh, a Boston cardiac surgeon, was one of the fathers of cardiac surgery, actually removed bullets from soldiers' hearts in World War II. So it gives you an idea. And, and this is you know, the, the individual who can do things that nobody else can do. And people like that, Dwight Harkin himself, was a bit like Teddy Roosevelt. He spoke and read uh, Greek ancient Greek, yeah. you know, so these were special people on earth to take care of, of sick people. And uh, that was very fascinating to me, and I met a lot of those people, but the people I tend to meet are the frustrated ones. They're early adopters, and inventors are generally uh, fanatic. They're not very good listeners. Because that's the only way you stay alive yeah. is you know, dramatic self-confidence. And as a result, I remember being fast by some of the inventions, but I said the only problem is, is this doctor comes with it. And, and <laughs> therefore, we're never going to get anywhere. Nobody's going to believe this yeah. person. And, uh, but along the way, I found a few people who had both. They were innovators, and they were understated. 
So that was really oxymoronic in terms of the combination of those personalities. And uh, was fascinated about, well, well, this is a great idea, but it's absolutely disruptive. I mean, it, it, it really is the poster child. It went Clean. against everything that the, the surgical team, the training, yeah. the way the hospitals were set up to do. Like it went against everything that was going on. Right? Well, you know, the irony is when, when I put our first business plan together, and by the way, uh, Peyton, if you're, you're, you're still uh, here, who uh, uh, goes to med school and is studying uh, entrepreneurship. And uh, uh, the question was, do you make the business plan first? Well, the, no. <laughs> yeah, you just head north. And, right. and then you learn more about what's going to go on, and then you put together right. the, what are the fundamental things that we really want to do here? And in the case of the predecessor to Boston Scientific, right which was a little company called Meditech that went from zero up to a couple million and then sold it to Boston Scientific that my partner and I had started. In the early days of this little Meditech company, we got outside, outsize interest from people in that we had the greatest gadgets you can imagine. And now it's kind of interesting too that I'm in the medical business. I was very sick when I was a kid, and I remember saying, I never want to go near a hospital again. But then I discovered that medicine had the greatest gadgets, these really neat toys that could do just about anything. And um, finding the gadgets was one thing, but finding the people who can help you transform the idea to a practical product is another. Did you know, me, you were, did you know when, you, when, when you founded Boston Scientific, did you know you were onto something that was game changing at the time? Did you, did you sense it at the beginning or did you? Well, there were two phases. The, the actual discovery about the less invasive surgery yeah. piece, which by the way, like everything in life had been going on earlier. Certain specialties did it. Urology right. had been doing it uh, for a while. But it got transformed more broadly, and that was something that we did. Uh, and uh, did I think it was going to grow? Uh, yeah, I thought it would grow, but I didn't think you know it was going to do it that quickly. And if you're running a little business, you have more of an attitude of, you know, every day is the first day of the rest of your life. It's just, it's survival. The AA rules apply to business junkies. And um, finding the right people, not just to hire, you certainly right. want them. You want them to buy into the, the vision. You want to create a sense of trust and culture and all of that. But from my point of view, I viewed our customers as part of our company. They were part of our culture, if you will. And uh, as it turns out, the, the doctors seem to like that. So tell me about the, um, I, I think you've heard me use this expression of uh, market makers versus share takers. So if, uh, if most yeah. people and organizations are share takers, this is the way surgery is done, these are the tools you use, this is how you get credentialed to be someone to do the procedure, uh, and I'm in that business so I find ways to take share. Yeah. And I compete yeah. with the hospital down sure. the street. Sure. Sure. And, uh, and uh, market makers, which I think you are, uh, are different than that, right? Wired to create a completely different market. And what uh, I'd love for, for you to share with us is what it took to be a market maker. How did you get the market to see the potential of minimally invasive surgery and then get the early adopters to then grow? Talk a little bit about the market making part of it. Well, first of all, the, the vision was as follows. We're gonna develop technology that leads to products, that leads to procedures, that reduces risk, trauma, cost, and time. Now I figured, how could anybody be against that? Well, it wasn't <laughs> that they were against it. 
<laughs> it's that I didn't have the credentials to be able to suggest it. The, the, the medical world is a collection of silos. And obviously, uh, this guy who was talking about using a tool as an alternative to surgery, going through a tiny hole. Right. They, I remember, I wish we had had uh, the little sort of GoPro recording things that I could have carried on my head, where surgeons were telling me that opening up the chest totally was actually much safer than working through a tiny hole. I said, excuse me, I'm, a, I, I'm, I'm not an expert surgeon, but that doesn't pass the common sense test. And the trauma of the surgery is greater right. than the trauma of the disease. Right. And uh, there's a lot of uh, disconnects in the medical community about that thing. This is, you know, uh, the patient died, but the surgery was successful. Right. And, and uh, I ran into a lot of that in the very early days of pacemakers. This right. was in, in, the, in the 60s. Uh, I would go along and I would take the pacemaker electrode and put it on my tongue to see if it was working. And you know that was quality control. And then we would take the, the little catheter and swish it off in alcohol and put it in the patient. And uh, you know safety is a relative thing. And compared to what the alternative was, that was great. So that was kind of the uh, very independent innovator uh, sort of environment. Uh, at, at one point, uh, you know, recognizing how, how do you get acceptance. I don't like to use the word market here because that's a subset of what I call how do you communicate a new idea okay. and get it accepted broadly. Not just commercially. I want it to be in yeah, people's like heads that. that this is a way to do it. Right. Everybody becomes part of, of the thing. And one of the things that, that, that happened in this uh, early adoption rule is you recognize that instead of the patient having anesthesia, the patient is awake and they become part of the procedure. They are a partner in being cured. Now, a lot of the doctors said, you know, they don't know anything, doesn't count, no. In fact, it's a bit of a pain in the neck because they can move or whatever it is. And I said, yeah, I, I, I don't think that's the case. And some of the, the docs that I talked to said, no. As a matter of fact, that's the best sensing of whether things are going okay. And we saw yesterday Stephen Keating oh demonstrating goodness. that at a whole Amazing. new level. The awake brain patient. Right. Just extraordinary stuff, but the idea of involving the patient as being a partner is empowering to the patient, and they will heal better. So work with some of these early visionary docs, one of them named, named, named Grunzig, who came up with this concept of using a balloon catheter to open up narrowed coronary arteries. Uh, he used to say, I want to do the least necessary to help the body heal itself. I love that. And I said, absolutely, that's, that's what it's got to be. And uh, it was rather fascinating that, by and large, we found early adopters, but they tend to be younger and less influential in the hospitals where they worked. Right. So they could do the cases, but the cases weren't referred to them because, in this case, it was the vascular surgeons, not the cardiac surgeon. The vascular surgeon works on the vessels everywhere but the heart. Right. Cardiac surgeon works in the heart. And occasionally you get a twofer. And uh, they would say, like happens in any field, this could be a promising field. And we want to see the 20 year data. I mean, <laughs> come on, on. And that was just, just, just life. How long did it take? So the, from the time. You know, the, the, uh, the products were out there, the procedure was starting to catch hold, but I imagine it was just happening in a few places around the country to, at, 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 uh, to at, today actually, where yeah. there's hardly a hospital that doesn't have a cath lab. Right? Almost but 25 years. Took, that, that took yeah. 25 years. In fact, I sometimes like to talk about the ATM. Do you know when the ATM was introduced? No. To, uh, 
1970 in North Carolina, uh, the automated teller. And uh, basically, it was 10 years before it became common. It took even, 10 years. So. Until, it took 10 years until they started ten, to use ten it. Years to get what, um, let's finish with um, you know, some advice from someone who's been uh, you know, through this um, to a room full of people who are trying to, uh, I like the way you approach that with trying to take a, a new idea uh, that uh, it can seem counter to the uh, prevailing idea. Uh, or construct. Uh, uh, what advice uh, do you have for uh, for your fellow innovation junkies here? Uh, if you've read the top 20 TED Talks, number three is by Simon Sinek. Yeah, it's a good and one. Uh, in essence, start out with why you're doing what you're doing. <laughs> have a reason. <laughs> it isn't shareholder value for crying out loud. You gotta produce value for your customers and ultimately for society itself. To me, and when we, we didn't go public until we were 250 million in sales and 20% after tax How, Say that again, profits. you didn't go public until when? 250 million in sales. You were private and then We you, were private then, until then. For the first, we didn't yep. have a board, but we constantly brought in people of all shapes and and, and types of experts and different types. In fact, we would eat uh, frequently at a, a Greek diner in Watertown. <laughs> and these guys, you know, first generation folks, the immense common sense they had. So we would tell them what we were doing and they would make insights that, you know, you'd normally pay a McKinsey guy <laughs> vast money for. So right. that to me is, is be open, have a purpose. Uh, Make sure you create a community of thinkers, uh, both within your company and outside your organization. And as I say, I, you know, I, I, I told the investors we're a profitable philanthropy. And, and yeah. uh, Goldman was our banker at the time. Yeah. He said, no, don't say that. I said, yes, do say that. Right. You've got to do it. John, uh, I think uh, the work you've done, your story, the Boston scientific success, uh, and for you to be this approachable, this thoughtful, uh, and to hang out with us is, is truly uh, a great thing, and I appreciate it always, John. Thank you. Thank you.